Activism is that which empowers the silent. I think poetry is a really public voice when you get right down to it. So many people who are not artists and who don't make things took a piece of cardboard off a box. There were so many wonderful signs of every kind. Puppetry is power. Um, when magic confronts authority, magic always wins. to represent the 200 people so far who have been murdered, civilians in Iraq. Imagine 9-11 times a billion. That's what the children of Iraq are feeling right now. We're here right now and we're lying down right here in the middle of Washington Square Park representing those who have, who have lost their lives, both, both our own, both soldiers and the Iraqis and the Iraqi children. We're all humans and to think that uh, one human would want to kill another human being, um, really just, I can't understand that. We need to stop this war before it gets worse and before more innocent people die. We may win the war, but we are losing our souls. And, um, the people that are lying down here are trying to reclaim their souls. I don't like this the country is upset. There's no war. 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 There's Best activism is that which empowers the silent. And as I've traveled the world, I've found that people really feel like they are subjects of the U.S. Empire. The song for me is just, it's, it's uh, uh, my way of service of trying to inspire the people to say, you know, this world is still a place that's worth struggling for. The one pot is the one that's fake, the one that's good, the nation's just two, three, and four. Chemical weapons, biological war. Push war one and push war two. They got a war for me, they got a war for me. We can't stop the way to be just My name really is Ahmed Ahmed, and I can't fly anywhere. <laughs> you guys too? It's a hard time to be named Ahmed. My name is Ahmed Ahmed, so it's better than ever. They pulled me off the plane. I was flying here to New York, and the guy was like, Mr. Ahmed, we have some questions we want to ask you. We're going to have to pull you off the plane. I was like, that's cool, I get it. My name is Ahmed Ahmed. And I am Arab. 
Sure. So I'm taking my seatbelt off. I'm getting out of my seat. Two white guys are sitting on each side of me like... I thought he was a Mexican. Just save my seat and go right now. the painting well since I was really very young when it was at the modern and I always I always really loved it and was very fascinated by it and because I thought I knew it so well if I wanted to copy a piece I thought well this will go quick but it was very complicated and very uh, very amazing how the parts locked together the, the lines of tears and just Everything about it is, is unfathomable, actually. I mean, and then I had done these women with the, the, dead, the dead children, the women in black. Part of what I found really wonderful about the demonstration was that so many people who are not artists and who don't make things in their sort of daily life, obviously thousands and thousands of them took a piece of cardboard off a box. There were so many wonderful signs of every kind, words, images, 
Some were funny, some were very cynical, but they were really full of life and they were real outpouring. Fresh Minden. This is totally fantastic to have this happen. You know that you come with new with things that come from the street, from the experience of protest, and for using puppetry this way and that way. It's a, it's a totally new branch of puppetry that this stupid country has never seen. demonstrators were storing things to block traffic. Riot police surrounded the Ministry of Puppet Ganda, where they kept the puppets for the protest that took place today. Police arrested over 70 people. Somebody's very scared of our big puppets, and uh, they should be because our big puppets spread the message of coming together, of peace, of joy, of solidarity. Puppetry is power. Um, when magic confronts authority, magic always wins. everything we can to protect the homeland. We will take actions necessary to protect American people. And we'll always value freedom. We will plant that flag of freedom forever by keeping strong and adhering to the values we hold so dear, starting with freedom. That you're either with us or you're against us. Are you either with us or you're with the enemy? You're either with us or against us. We mean it. There's no middle ground when it comes to freedom and terror. They should not protest because it is in the best interest of freedom and humankind. And I'm going to leave it at that.
I'm going to read a poem of six lines by a hero of mine. He's a visionary. His name is Cameron Penny, and he is in the fourth grade. He is. He's amazing. He's in the fourth grade in a Michigan school. Cameron Penny wrote this. He said, if you are lucky in this life, a window will appear on a battlefield between two armies. And when the soldiers look into the window, they don't see their enemies. They see themselves as children. And they stop fighting and go home and go to sleep. <laughs> when they wake up, the land is well again. This poem was originally entitled, A Nursery Rhyme George W. Bush Could Read on His Own. Closer reading, we found out some of the words were still too big. If war was not an option, please, New York City, let me hear you. If war was not an option, I would leave no children dead. Instead of bombs, I would learn to use my head. If war was not an option, I would plant flowers, not mines in the Iraqi soil and I would use solar energy instead of crude oil if war was not an option. I would stop dreaming of gasoline. I would become a grown-up and no longer so mean if war was not an option. I would no longer threaten voices of dissent. In fact, I would actually find questions quite pleasant if war was not an option. I would extend my hand in sincere friendship and call home our people on the battleships. If war was not an option, I would no longer fear anyone ever finding out it was the U.S. that gifted Saddam all his evil clout. If war was not an option. Come on, y'all, let me hear you. If war was not an option, I would spend money on education and health care and promise all Americans they would be treated fair. One more time. If war was not an option, America would become a respected and well-loved nation. Now all I have to do is use my imagination. Lou Moretta is a character that I've um, created who is based on a woman that actually lives in the or lives next to the Amaria bomb shelter. There is a um, Amaria bomb shelter was bombed in 1991 during the first Gulf War, and there is a woman there who lost all of her family in that in that bombing. Um, but her way of dealing with that was to um, set up a trailer and live outside and, and take people through as a tour. And this character is loosely based. Um, it's based on circumstances from her life, and I had met her when I was there in 1991 and took the tour of the shelter. I am hard to understand why it's I survive and my children did. I ask Allah why. Why you make me alive. That night it's all people die. 403 people. There is nothing we can do. They are dead. This is Amaria Bumshatar. Here they write their name in chalk over the smoke figure. Here, on the ceiling, you see it, a charred handprint footprint from people who lay in the top bunk. Here, it's a silhouette of a woman. She is vaporized from the heat. This huge room, it's become like an oven, and they press to the wall to escape from the flame. La, La I don't want to show you there. It's too much. Walls, they are stuck with hair and skin. I take you to the roof. You can see how the hole it was made. Two bombs from U.S. airplane. They come to this point of the roof. The first bomb, it's a, a drilling bomb. Second bomb, it come inside exactly same spot. It explodes in fire. U.S. said they thought it's communication center for military, but people here know, think they wanted to kill as many people as possible. Now look around the hole. Wild greens, they are growing. Eh? Life to choose to root here in this grave of Iraqi people. All, it's my family, it's here. Ghada, 
it's here. So I am on Ghada, mother of tomorrow. I take my full name back when I see it smile again. Then I know my daughter and son, they are alive again. I think poetry is a really public voice when you get right down to it. And although the poem is made in private, there's a, a public aspect. It's almost impossible to write a poem that has no political implications. Where is that voice from nowhere? That burning bush, that passing dove, for I hear voices of generals calling for ammunition, presidents calling for arms, and women calling for help. And it was almost as though the whole country was waiting for the right march, the right moment, the right speech to stand up and say, wait a minute, we don't want to be accountable for 600 or 700,000 civilian deaths or a million. Where is that voice from nowhere, that God of Abraham? Can he be heard over the gunfire, the whiz of passing missiles, the crash of buildings, the cries of children, the crack of bones, the shriek of sirens? Or is that his mighty voice, your angry God craving the sacrifice of virgin generation, sons degenerate, your holy books written and ready Ink on burning sands. Your prayers between rounds do no more than fasten the fate of your children to the hammered truth of your trigger, a truth that mushrooms its darkened cloud over the rest of us so that we too bear witness to the short-lived fate of a civilization that worships a male god. I think a lot of people in this country are feeling kind of beaten down by this administration that has very little tolerance for differences of opinion, and much of the right wing is uh, rude and abrasive about their uh, treatment of people who disagree with them. I have been photographing for four decades about many, many different concerns in a documentary style. The series The Forbidden Pictures is not a documentary style, in fact. It's it's a fabricated style based on the paintings of George Groves, Otto Dix, and Max Beckmann. I decided that rather than having the corpulent replication of the Weimar Republic decadent men, that I would replace them with the George Bush look-alike and people who were more or less equivalent of the members of his cabinet. The woman has to be seen as a metaphor for the world. The groping has to be seen as what we've been doing in our foreign policy, which is groping almost blindly and taking advantage of our imperious power. All my life, I've been wondering how in the world could you become, make a, uh, your work political. The second picture is an Otto Dix picture called The Salon. In this one, I did politicize it to a point, an absurdist point, by placing porcelain elephants on the table for a symbol of the Republican. The third one is coming from a a Max Beckman painting called The Party. It's pretty much about a certain level of wildness and deadness all exclaiming at the same time. All of the pictures are not specifically political like the one of Salacious George and his, and his fondling moment, but political in so far that they talk about infidels. It's about people who are emotionally deconstructed and outside of the boundaries of their heart. stripping for a cause, they seem to catch more attention than, you know, a set of boobs selling a Budweiser on a billboard. We've had 14,000 hits a day on our website, and we're up to something like 24 million 
uh, visitors. The story has gone from Tel Aviv to uh, Hong Kong to Tokyo to uh, Washington, D.C., New York. The buzz is out there. There's no stopping it, and it's continuing. These photographs are iconographic. Never in the history have we had uh, such a visual movement. <laughs>